Hello everyone. Today we'll be having a look at the ambiguity in inductive statistical explanations and we'll do so based on Carl Hempel's text, Inductive Statistical Explanations. So, let's see. We start our story with the deductive pneumological explanation, which is the explanation that you already know and it use, makes use of law-like statements. So why do we call this deductive? As you'll see on the left side, the deductive explanation can be seen as a, just like all other explanations, can be seen as a argument which take the deductive form. So if A, then B, A is present, therefore B must necessarily follow. Since it is a deductive argument, that means that this argument is truth preserving. If all the premises are true, then the conclusion must necessarily be true. We call the, this argument deductive nomological because nomological stands for law governed. That has to do with the fact that all these deductive nomological explanations make reference to laws. So we can imagine the law all metal expense upon heating. We know that these support the counterfactual if I heat up metal, then it expands. So we could see the statement here as saying, if I heat metal, then it expands. I have heated the metal, therefore it must expand. So what's the difference with the inductive statistical explanation exactly? Well, first of all, we'll not use a general or strict law, but we will make use of a probabilistic law. In this, to illustrate this, we could use the case of <clears throat> John. John is very unfortunate because he has fallen ill with strepsococcus. And we know that if we treat people who have strepsococcus with penicillin, that there's a very good chance that they'll recover. So this is the argument you'll find in the middle. Yet, that would lead us to an argument where we claim, therefore, um, John is very likely to recover. However, actually, this is not what we want to predict. We want to predict John's recovery, not the fact that he's very likely to recover. So we'll see that the very likely will have to move to a qualification. And that's what you'll see in the third argument. We here have the probabilistic law. We have the statement that John indeed has strepsococcus and that we treated him with penicillin. And the inference from the premises to the conclusion is not necessitating, as in the deductive nomological argument, but rather is very likely. That means that in this case, we are dealing with a inductive line of reasoning, since even if both premises are true, so the probabilistic law concerning recovery, and that we treat a John with penicillin, there is still a natural selection of cases in which the uh, patient does not recover when treated with penicillin. So even though the premises are true, the conclusion does not necessarily have to be so. Now, let's have a look at where the explanatory ambiguity comes in. Because John is a very unfortunate individual. He does not only have a streptococcus infection. No, he has a penicillin resistant strand of the illness. We now see that that means that it's possible to make a separate argument, which we see on the right side, that states that people who have strepsococcus, the resistant strain of strepsococcus, and are treated with penicillin, actually, it's very likely for them to not recover from their infection. So what we have now is two competing arguments, one which infers a high probability on John's recovery, and one which infers a low probability on John's recovery, or a high probability on the non-recovery. This is the explanatory ambiguity which haunts statistical, inductive statistical explanations. Because what are we to do? 
which one is the more likely answer here? Which one should the doctor rely on when he's trying to predict what the right course of treatment would be in, for a patient? Because the problem is here that both explanations apply to John because he does have streptococcus, but not just the general form, but the specific strand, which is penicillin resistant. And the two give us different arguments. As you might see, oh, as you might see, part of that becomes is due to the fact that we use separate or different reference classes. It should be noted at this point that there is no analog of this problem when we, uh, in deductive nomological explanations. The reason for that is that deductive nomological explanations are truth preserving. So if the premises are true, then there must be a true conclusion. And if we consider our set of scientific knowledge internally consistent, then it's never possible that you have these two contradicting explanations. So this problem can be reformulated to the epistemic case of the explanatory ambiguity, because we actually know that in our scientific knowledge, we are rarely sure that our premises are actually true. Actually, we'll deal with premises which are accepted or assumed to be correct on the basis of empirical science. So this is closer to the actual practice, and we'll see that the problem arises as well, because it is very likely that we assume both of these statements, or both of these probabilistic laws. And again, the epistemic version also does not have an equivalent in the deductive nomological model. What we see here is that these problems of explanatory ambiguity bedevil the predictive use of statistical arguments. As whether John recovers from his affection, yes or no, is not a case in favor of either of the two arguments, since even the argument that puts a high likelihood on John's recovery allows for a minimal set of cases where he does not recover, and even the argument that says it's very likely that he will not recover allows for a small amount of cases um, in which John actually does recover. So, is there any logical basis for relying on one rather than the other argument while making your prediction? What are we to do? Well, we have seen that the contradicting arguments are possible because they refer to the different subsets. One to the penicillin resistant strand of Strepsococcus and one to the Strepsococcus family in general. It is therefore not unreasonable to suggest that we should use the explanation which makes use of most relevant information. And that is where the requirement of maximal specificity is going to come in. So we have here highlighted the separate reference classes. And at this point, you'll probably go something, your mind probably goes somewhere like, um, what's all this fuss about? Isn't it obvious that the explanation, which includes the fact that Strepsococcus, uh, that he had a resistance strand of Strepsococcus, is the better explanation? If you do that, you are correct, because to use all the relevant information means to describe the case which references, which references the narrowest class that John is a member of. So we use the explanation which takes note of the specific strand of the disease rather than the one which just states that John is ill. What we should note now is that, the, is that this requirement of maximal specificity is only a maxim for the application of inductive logic. It does not make one of the two more valid than the other because the inferences are still normal inductive inferences, but it forms a necessary condition of rationality with regards to the usage of inductive logic. Or simply put, it says that it's the wisest usage of inductive logic when 
we uh, take all information in consideration and refrain from doing otherwise. Also note that this does not mean that you only use all relevant information at hand. If research has so shown that people who have an underlying heart condition are all, also have a lower chance of recovery when treated with when having this disease and treated with penicillin, then the doctor must investigate whether or not John actually has heart problems. And if we know that having a six toe on your left foot it does not bear on the recovery rate, then the doctor does not have to look at John's feet. So we're going to leave out for now the more technical part of Hempel's, um, of Hempel's proof that this works. But we do want to have a look at slightly which ID is employed to determine the most narrow reference class. So you can imagine that if we consider all knowledge at a given time, that this would yield a specific recovery rate. And this knowledge at a specific time is what Hempel will call K. And let's say that our recovery rate here is 10%. Based on the fact that he... Uh, so like... So... If we use all knowledge and we get a recovery rate of 10%, that must mean that there is a specific reference class which also yields a recovery rate of 10%. And we define the narrowest reference class with regards to that. Well, we also know that, those narrow, that this narrowest reference class might, for instance, include, if we use all knowledge available, Something like the fact that John will have six toes on his left feet. But it seems ludicrous to include that fact. Why? Because we know that it has no explanatory bearing on John's recovery rate. So how do we determine then what to include and not to include for Naren's reference class? Well, we must use all statistical laws that bear on recovery and non-recovery, and as statistical facts, so to determine the reference class, we take into consideration everything that is mentioned in the antecedent of those um, laws. And what you will see then is if we leave out any of the relevant factors, so for instance the fact that he has the penicillin-resistant strain on the, of, the vir of the disease, then our initial recovery rate will not be 10%, but actually more something like 90% as that we see in the argument where the reference class is just based on the fact that John has streptococcus. So there the reference class is not narrow enough. So whenever the inductive statistical explanations yield two possible probabilities or two different likelihoods for a conclusion, then one of the two must violate the requirement of maximal specificity. This holds for the epistemic formulation of the problem, which we now see in front of us, so where we don't know which one is actually true, but it also holds for the more general formulation where we do know that our premises is true. It is still the case that both arguments consist of true premises in that case, but one of the two, in this case where we consider the left hand argument, where we consider the left hand argument, will violate the rationality requirement for the usage of inductive statistical explanations, and therefore is still not an explanation that we rely on, or we have a rational reason to prefer the usage of the other argument. Now we have solved the problem of explanatory ambiguity, but this comes at a cost. Namely, we have to use the knowledge that is currently available to us in order to decide which of the two explanations is the best or the most rational one to use. This means that there is an epistemic relativity with regards to statistical explanations when we try to explain a particular event. This means that we can, with regard to inductive statistical explanations, 
not speak of a true or false explanation, as we can do with deductive nomological explanations, but always have to speak of a potential explanation. Because the moment our knowledge situation changes, laws have been disregarded or new accepted laws, or new laws have been accepted, the previously used explanation might violate the requirement of maximal specificity because the change in a body of knowledge can lead to a change in what is considered the narrowest reference class. And therefore, the previously used explanation might not be rational anymore. This epistemic relativity persists even in the general formulation of the case because it hinges on what is considered the narrowest reference case. And this problem cannot be overcome. Note again that since we don't have the problem of ambigu explanatory ambiguity with deductive nomological explanations, this epistemic relativity in this sense does not occur with deductive nomological explanations. So, to summarize Hempel's argument, explanatory ambiguity bedevils the explanatory power of inductive statistical explanations. However, this can be solved by applying the requirement of maximum specificity, but it comes at the cost of making inductive explanations epistemically relative. This cannot be overcome and implies that we can only speak of potential inductive statistical explanations instead of something more definitive.